And the, the straw that broke the camel's back was actually losing my Fitbit of all things. I was packing up to go to the airport for, you know, if this thing, something else had gone wrong and I was just, I was hanging on by a thread and my Fitbit fell out of my, my, off my wrist packing for my laptop in my bag. And that just, that was just the thing that's just like, I can't do it anymore. I so said like, I may not come back to this office. I was in tears on the way to the airport talking to my wife. Um, and so he finally said, look, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to see some friends. We're going to have a good experience. And on the way back, I said, something has to change. Here's the thing. The fastest growing companies in the world, they're small businesses, often with less than 100 employees. So how are gritty entrepreneurs, CEOs, and founders like us going up against massive markets, scaling teams, building systems, and skyrocketing to success before crashing and burning? This podcast will give you those answers. My name is Chris Ronzio. Welcome to the fastest growing companies. Welcome back, everybody. Today, I'm talking with Brett Snyder, founder and CEO of Knuckle Puck. Hey, Brett, welcome to the show. Hey, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. So real quick, tell us a little bit about your business, like the elevator pitch or what it's all about. Yeah, so Knuckle Puck is a digital marketing and web development agency. So on the marketing side, we have SEO, paid media, content marketing services. And on the web side, we're doing exclusively in WordPress development. Um, but the range of projects that we'll work on can be anything from small businesses to, you know, highly complex, you know, associations with different integrations. You know, we're doing a project now with a large commercial real estate firm that, you know, is helping us build out various segments of their business. And so we really look for, you know, what are the actual needs that we have to address? And then we scope the work around that. Okay, great. So if you go back to the beginning, why this business? Why, why did you start this thing? So I think why I started in the SEO side is I, I fell into a, a you know a digital internship. I was actually running Speedos at the time was Google AdWords, you know now Google Ads campaign during the 08 Summer Olympics. You know that was my my first kind of introduction to it and seeing the amount of of impact that you can have and how much frankly how much money is being spent through these channels to drive that visibility was really really exciting. Um, so I got an opportunity to join a, at the time, a very small SEO and digital media shop um, in Philadelphia called Sear Interactive. Um, yeah. They have since gone on to, I think they're 150 plus 200 people now. Um, you know, Will, their founder, who's a, a mentor of mine, is, you know, speaks around the world as a, kind of an evangelist and advocate for SEO. And so I got to really get a sense of, of learning the space there. And, and a lot of that has informed what I wanted to do when I started Knucklepuck. So if you can do uh, SEO or AdWords for Speedo, I feel like you can do it for anything in the world. Like that. Yeah, I mean that's that's the appeal of an agency, right? At least for me, right? You don't, you know, I, I like to have different kind of things that I can look at, I, and I think the folks that that we work with like being involved in several projects at once because you'd be surprised at what you can learn from a moving company in Ohio that can apply to a, a SaaS company, you know, doing compliance, you know, and regulation software. You know, it's just totally. understanding and being involved in search results, being involved in these dashboards, tweaking bids, you know, really kind of getting some exposure to various things, I think makes us stronger. Yeah. I used to say my consulting business was industry agnostic and it was, that was part of the fun was borrowing solutions from over here and using them there and seeing what people are doing everywhere. So I, I totally agree. Now, th this show is all about growing, scaling a business. You've had some tremendous growth over the years. In terms of the people side, you went from a couple people up to about 18, you said now, but revenue's grown dramatically. So, you know, I, I, and where are you at now? You said people, 18? I think we're at 18. Yeah. We're, we're looking to add some new folks now to, to accommodate some growth that we've, you know, some, you know, initial growth we're seeing in 2020. Awesome. Awesome. And so, so as you've grown, what do you think's been the the secret sauce that really help has helped you attract people and and build the right team? Yeah, I think there's kind of there's two sides to the coin, right? There's the the culture side, which you know is an answer for everybody, but how it manifests is is kind of what stands apart. And then then there's the logistics of it. And so I think the logistics aren't really spoken about as as often. You know, I think that's like understanding like not just that there's a growth path for you, but like, but what is that? What does it look like to go from a junior consultant role to a consultant role? You know, we talk about having a management track and an individual contributor track so that we don't see people who could be very high performers in an individual contributor role that may struggle with management. Um, and I think that's been another big part of, of what has allowed us to, to be successful in growing is the logistics behind you know, the investments we've tried to make in our middle management to provide some leadership exposure, um, you know, really trying, knowing that everybody has to kind of own their own destiny a little bit, yeah. but then managers have to own a little bit of everybody else's. 
you know, and finding that right balance in the way that that's able to, to come through in, in the way that we meet with our team, you know, the way that we try to give enough autonomy that people feel that they can do their work, right? We're you're hired for your brain. You know, we need to, we need to see it go to work, but also make sure that we've got support and guidance. Yeah, it sounds like you've put a lot of proactive attention into the people management versus individual contributor paths. And a lot of people don't realize that those are different things. Mm-hmm. You know, they don't think about the next role, the, the just the one they're being hired for. So that's a great tip. Who who were your first couple hires? And and how did you know that that's who you needed for the team? So my my first hire is actually a really, really interesting story because Megan worked for us for about three years, got a really great in-house opportunity a couple years ago. But then we actually brought her back in to run the marketing team, you know, to run the entire marketing team last January. I love uh, it. And, and a lot of it was for similar reasons. And, and one piece that I, you know, I'll speak to that is you know, we always tell people to leave the right way, both as a company and as an employee, you know, because your reputation carries on. And, you know, Megan got a great opportunity and, and I will never begrudge any of my folks for pursuing a, an opportunity that's going to enrich their lives and, and, you know, advance their career. Um, but she put us in a position to be successful. And then we had a chance to bring her back. But the first time I hired, I hired her with no experience. And she actually went to both of us, our Villanova University alums. She went to the Villanova alumni group and said, these are my skills. And this is this is where I think I'd be strong. Um, and I called her. And I, I had no office. I actually got an office. Our first office was so I didn't put her on my couch in my townhouse. <laughs> um, I, I've always said I, I can teach you SEO. I can teach you the, the core building blocks of, of the service we provide. I can't teach you to care. And I can't teach you to, to own your own your own circumstances and, and take advantage of the tools. Um, one phrase I use a lot is that you know I can I can give you the tools, but you have to build the house. Yeah, and it sounds like she was a little bit of a risk taker if she was willing to be that first person to come and work on the the first desk that wasn't your couch. Yeah, right. I mean, I, and we we met. I told her exactly what it was. Like, look, we don't have any other people, but here's the plan that I have. Here's the you know, here's the the trajectory I'd like to take it on, and you're going to work, you know, with me. Here's the stability of the business as it stands right now, you know, so that you know that there's, you know, there's not something that's going to disappear on you in a, a couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, but she certainly took a took a chance on me. Yeah, I remember the same thing. Hiring my first person in my first business, it's so much of it's selling them that your business is not about to collapse, right? <laughs> yeah, but that is a real thing. <laughs> That's funny. So, so then as as uh, and I love that you mentioned the offboarding too and the transitioning out, and that, that says a lot about your culture that you want that to be a good experience for people. So, kudos on that. What What do you think's been the hardest part about your team getting larger? Uh, you know. Your your recruitment pipeline and your biz dev pipeline never quite seem to line up, do they? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you never you never quite seem to have them both peak at the same time, and and I think that's been a challenge for us over the years. You know, we've had times where we've hired expecting you know to have or, or overhired, and you know, and then we had to to do a reduction a couple of years ago. You know, one of the worst experiences, but very much a necessary one for the the health and, and success of the business long term. Um, but it really got us to understand like, all right, how long does it take for us to train up a junior person to be able to really be effective on projects versus how long does it take to onboard, to recruit and onboard somebody with experience? And so that's why we really look at our hours allocation very, very heavily, because we want to get a sense of how much buffer do we have left. And looking at, you know, for our junior roles, for example, we have a kind of a six month ramp up. You know, we have a, a six month plan for folks that come in. You don't have to have any experience. But if you prove that you can learn the skills, you prove that you can start to, to have an impact, you know, then we're going to try to grow you on that. And so you said right before we started recording, you had kind of a ratio or a percentage that you aim for in order for your to do your capacity planning, right? Yeah, we actually do our we do our capacity planning on a 75% billable margin or a billable threshold margin. I'm not, not sure what the word is there, yeah. um, which I know is, is very low um, just in terms of, of what's expected of of generally of, of agency work, you know, and, and the consultants there. But we always look at this and say, like, it's going to take more time than this. I'm going to ask you to do something in the third week of the month because we got a proposal or we have a new project kicking off. Yeah. And I, I have to know that there's an opportunity for us to have a pace that we all agree is a reasonable and acceptable baseline pace because yeah. we are going to have to sprint off of that, but we have to know, you know what we're sprinting from. 
So great exercise for anyone listening is to do exactly what you just recommended and come up with some sort of forecast for their hiring, because it doesn't just, you know, magically happen that you've got more work and you've got people willing to do that work on the same day. Like you said, it takes a lot of planning, a lot of effort. So if anyone listening hasn't done that work, please put together a headcount sort of forecast, a projection for where you're going to meet certain capacity thresholds and where it makes sense to hire. I think that's such a great tip. So, so Brett, you mentioned hitting a couple harder times. Was there a point in your growth where you just worried that things wouldn't work out, that the business wouldn't make it? Was there any, any of those like dark, dark days? Oh yeah, there was, I mean, I, I remember actually very vividly, we were talking before my, my actually only time I've ever been to Arizona was for a, a bachelor party for a friend of mine from college and a, a roommate afterwards. Um, and that was at the point where I had a, I had a very, very toxic member of my board who was just absolutely, just absolutely poisoning everything from our client relationships to our team, to different work we had done together. Um, we had had, that was right around when we had to do a reduction a couple of, of weeks earlier. And then we lost two of our three managers in the span of like six days. Um, wow. Both were great opportunities that again, I, I can't begrudge them, you know, pursuing the opportunity, especially with, you know, we were, we were working a huge, huge client, um, you know, one big enough that we can't talk about it. Um, but that I had not scoped properly. So big revenue number, but huge, huge hours hit. Um, and I remember like looking, you know, just having everything just closing in and feeling like it was closing in. And the the straw that broke the camel's back was actually losing my Fitbit of all things. I was packing up to go to the airport for, you know, for this thing, something else had gone wrong. And I was just, I was hanging on by a thread and my Fitbit fell out of my, my off my wrist, packing for my laptop, in my bag. And that just, that was just the thing that's just like, I can't do it anymore. I so like, I may not come back to this office. I was in tears on the way to the airport talking to my wife. Um, and so he finally said, look, like, I'm going to go, I'm going to see some friends. We're going to have a good experience. And on the way back, I said, something has to change. Um, so, you know, we made some of the changes to the business. I you know, demanded this you know, person be removed from the board. You know, I, I took control of the circumstances I could, could take control over. Um, but yeah, my, my toes were curled over the edge and, and I had, you know, and I think it's, it's probably similar to a lot of folks that you talk to, you know, most people in our role don't n really see the edge very often, but when I found it, it, it was, it was scary, but it was also enlightening and gave me a lot of clarity. Wow. Well, congrats for getting through that. I know a lot of us have had those kind of moments. And it's also impressive that you took all of those steps to improve your business without your Fitbit. Yeah, right. <laughs> <Very> good. <laughs> Unintended. All right. So if you had to pinpoint, like as you came out of that, as you were growing, um, thinking through some of your big wins over the years, what do you think has really unlocked some of the quick growth? Was it a certain client, an idea, a connection, a new service that you offered? Can you pinpoint anything? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's the people, right? You know, it's it's you know, it's it's the folks that stepped into these roles. The the woman who now runs operations for us. When we lost our other two managers, she had been running our paid media team at the time. Um, and she basically took over our SEO and our content team. And I think at the time, paid media was three people. SEO was like 10 and content was like two or three. And so all of a sudden taking on services that she didn't know, but you know, she had a commitment to, you know, to getting it done and to figuring it out and to making sure that the people who were here and committed to us were able to see the return on, on their investment in, in Knuckle Puck. Um, and so I give Maura a lot of credit for, you know, after that tough year, you know, she really helped steer us in a better direction. Um, I acquired a small web development agency a couple of years ago, you know, and once that had really onboarded, they're very, you know, they've been working together for a long time. They have a lot of independent vision for what they want to do with this department. Um, and I think that was another reason why we brought Megan back to the marketing role, you know, who was my first hire and, and came back was because she had that vision and she had an ability to say, it's aligned with mine, which is critical for, you know, for an executive team, but she had her own independent vision as did Maura, you know, when she took over marketing and moved to operations as does Corey overseeing the dev team. I and mean, I think that's really been the big piece is, is knowing that you have the right folks around that have an alignment of vision with you, but also the ability to execute on that vision. So they're aligned with your vision. They can execute on the vision. And what I heard is that they have some of their own vision as well that maybe extends yours. Yeah. But and ask like they have you have to care about it for yourself, right? Like if, if you're just going in there and you're only doing it because you want to impress me, or you're only doing it because it's my vision of what work life balance means, you know, there's there's a an end date on that, right? Like there's a natural time or natural mortality to that kind of mindset. 
But if you go in there and you say like, no, like I want this, like this gives me the balance that I have. I'm able to travel where I want to. I'm able to have flexibility to see my family. I'm able to work with people that respect me for who I am and clients that, that appreciate the value that we bring. You know, you have to, you have to care about that yourself or there's no incentive for you to, to give it your all, I, I think, or at least a, a, not a maximum incentive. Yeah, hundred percent agree. Okay, so let's turn to to what some people say is the hardest part of growing a business, and that's delegation, letting go, passing mm -hmm. things off to other people. Um, what's what's helped you get better at delegation? Um, that's a good question. That is a hard one because it's it's not something that you just you know you don't graduate delegation school right like and and you don't you don't get it right the first time right you kind of you overcorrect you know I, I i probably could speak to this in our operations role so we've had three operations you know people that have been hired to you know to run operations it was either a business operations manager morris now our director of ops um, and that's because I never really had an interest in running a business you know i was the marketing guy that started a business to support my marketing habit um, so the actual running of a business was never all that appealing to me. I'm, I'm good at it, but it was something that I would love to be able to offboard. Um, first time, I didn't know what the role was at all. I deferred to, to you know, the as since been removed member of my board who referred over somebody who was not qualified to do the job, but I was not qualified to, to evaluate whether he could do it or whether he was doing it while I was paying him to do it. Um, and so at that point, I had delegated too much. I think where I just, I, I didn't know what it was. I just took somebody's trust for it, but then I realized I have to learn. I can't make that mistake again. So the next business operations person, I went and I wrote down every possible operational or administrative thing that goes into running a business from fixing the printer to, you know, doing the PL to our taxes, to our hiring and onboarding, running HR, everything. It filled, it filled 12 feet of whiteboard wall in our conference room. I um, mean, I said, cool. I'm not going to mess this up again. Like, here's what it is. Now it's just a matter of carving it up. Um, and in that case, the, the fatal flaw there is there were too many things that I put out there where it's very easy to pick out. Here's a couple of things that I can speak to very intelligently. Whereas none of that mattered when I couldn't trust you with financial analysis the way that I would expect to, or I couldn't trust you with being able to do document management so that there's consistency of our, you know, of our documentation I and mean, our templates. And so I learned that the second time that I almost tried to get too granular for it. I mean, at the end, I really, I, I don't know that I solved it, right? I, I think it was, you know, I, I found somebody who, who worked, who, who had gone through both of those people previously, who understood why it didn't work and understood what I needed as, as an executive to have somebody take things off my plate or, or prove that you're trustworthy enough for me to give you control of things that previously I, I would not get rid of. And the last two times I did, it, it kind of bit me, right? And so I think the difference was just finding somebody and being open to and, and trusting a new relationship, right? And being able to know that if you're going to trust it, then you, you have to, to go into it believing it will work. Yeah, well, I mean, great example. And a couple of things that you said that I want to just repeat back you had to know first what to take off your plate. And that was part of your evaluation, it sounds like. And then you had to know how to evaluate if someone could do those things. And so just knowing enough to scratch the surface to find the right person was part of a success criteria. And then not overloading them with the things on their list of responsibilities. So I mean, three amazing tips baked in there to really get better at delegation. So um, wh whether you think you're, you're, you've solved it or not, it sounds like you've figured out definitely uh, uh, it's some more steps along the way. It's ongoing trial and error, right? We're yeah. we're in uh we're in the the cycle of trial and error until until we're until it's over. <laughs> so so what's next for you and Knuckle Puck? What's what's one thing you're working on right now that you're excited about? Um, so one thing that we're really excited about that we focused on throughout most of last year and really over the last couple of years is we've been building out. We're calling it our small business platform. Um, it's it's basically a, a WordPress, you know, a custom WordPress theme and set of tools that we've realized that you know, we're building these sites over and over and over again, and we're being asked to build very similar tools. And when it's a custom site with some of these tools, you, know, you could be talking 15, 20 grand for a site, which is cost prohibitive for a lot of small businesses. But if we could build a platform that allows us to bring these tools together to have something that's you know, consistently managed, and we can price it at 10, because we know that we have the ability to then work with you to architect it, to skin it with your branding, your, your styling, give you the, the capacity to, to build out as much depth as you need to on this platform. 
Um, so we just actually launched a, uh, a demo site that we use called thehappinessagency.com um, that we use just completely fake. I wrote all the content there. Our consultants do not work. Contact us goes to me. You will not, there, none of these services exist, but um, we're really excited because now we have something tangible that we can show. You know, we have a demo site that we can bring in and we can show people, you know, our goal is to make content management easy, but we can show you how that works. We can show you what the thought we put into the back end design as much as, as the front end, yeah. you know, and, and the flexibility that goes with it. So had yeah. some, some good positive feedback on that and excited to see what we can do with it. So in a sense, you've kind of productized like all the experience that you've had building these sites for people and you found what's repeatable and what tools and you figured out how to offer that at a better price. So it's more accessible. That's awesome. Yeah. And I think that's, that's probably applicable to anybody listening, right? Like that's, that's a kind of a standard, you know, business goal, right? Like find yeah. ways to, to scale in, in that sense. And it just came from being conscious of, Hey, we keep building this meet the team block. Everybody asks for a lot client logos block. Everybody, like we should find some way to do this in a more scalable fashion because our approach has always been about speed. We don't care how, you know, I don't care how expensive the site is. We've done 10 grand sites. We've done quarter million dollar sites. What I care about is how much, how long is it going to take for us to get it done? And can we move through it quickly and efficiently? I mean, that's, that's really been the, the core focus of all of it. Efficiency, my kind of guy. I love it. All right. If people want to connect with you, Brett, or learn more about your business, where would you direct them to? Yeah, so our, our website is knucklepuckmedia.com. I'm still trying to get the folks at knucklepuck.com to sell it to me. <laughs> uh, so we're knucklepuckmedia.com. I mean, my email is brett, B-R-E-T-T, at knucklepuckmedia. So feel free, to, feel free to reach out. Definitely let me know that you're coming in from the show. Amazing. All right. So Brett, you heard from Brett, everyone, um, some tips on how he went from just him selling Speedos on Google all the way up to a team of almost 20. Uh, he's doing a lot of cool things. So congrats, Brett, on your success. And if you're listening, hopefully you can borrow a page from Brett's playbook as you build yours. We'll see you next time. Thanks again, Brett. Of course. Thanks for having me. Hey, thanks for listening to the Fastest Growing Companies podcast. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe and leave a review. If you found the information helpful, share it with your friends and family that can benefit from it. You can also find Trainual's company account at Trainual, just like a training manual. We'll see you next time.